you're using this mic and Anson here. Awesome, thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Jimmy Nelson. I'm uh, the new food web lead, taking uh, Linda Deegan's place at the Plum Island LTR. And uh, another new member is Jen Bowen, right? And that's it for the, two, the new, new folks. Other, in other news, we were renewed in 2022 for Pi 5, so we had a nice fun ASM. Uh, <laughs> the beer just tasted better. Um, and so in, in Pi 5, there's more emphasis on sort of synthetic modeling across the watersheds, from the watershed to the ocean, uh, in both the biogeochemistry and the, and the food webs. And I'm gonna talk some about that synthetic modeling today. Uh, and then we have new leverage projects investigating impacts of uh, seawater intrusion on the Lega Haleen zone. So as sea levels rising, moving up the tidal river into the Lega Haleen zone, those impacts that are that are having, and that's being led by Inca Forbrick, who uh, who just got a new job at University of Toledo. So good job, good job, Inca. Um, and so talking some about the food web and scaling at Plum Island. Um, so this is the domain of, of, of the Plum Island uh, LTR, uh, and we have these watersheds that that that, that put water into the estuary. And then we have this, this coastal marsh system, the salt, salt marsh system that goes into a, the sound and then sort of all drains uh, out through the bottom of the sound in the, in the lower part of the bay there. And it's very tidally driven. You know, these very segmented habitats that go from sand flats to, to uh, Spartina alternate floor marsh up to Spartina Peyton marsh and then eventually the upland. Um, and one of the things that we've done in Plum Island, which is really, really cool, uh, is a, it was started in 1999. I was in high school, all right. Um, <laughs> is this long-term uh, isotope food web data set where we collected the exact same uh, functional groups in the food web since 1999 for, with carbon and, and nitrogen, but also uh, for almost 15, 15 years now with carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. And so we collect all the primary producers and all the way up to trophic levels in these sort of three discrete areas across the domain of Plum Island. And so what I wanted to do, and so you've heard from, from Deepak and Dan about all these issues we have with scaling of primary production and looking at the different patterns and all the issues with that. So I decided to go ahead and just sprinkle some more madness on it and see if we can extend some of these things to the food web, uh, to the, the drivers of the food web we see in Plum Island across the spatial domain. And so this is a really, everybody puts this as their title slide for Plum Island. So if you've seen this a million times, now you've seen it a million one times, uh, but this is looking down the Rally River out towards Plum Island proper and then over Plum, Plum Island proper is the Gulf of Maine. And so you can see we have this very sort of like structured landscape where they have these larger rivers, smaller tidal creeks, smaller tidal creeks, and everything is very reticulated in certain areas. And so you can imagine if you're a consumer and you're interacting at different spatial scales with this landscape, there are different things that are driving how you're using the landscape and using the resources across this varied spatial structure. And so what we've noticed in this long-term food web data set, and so these are isotope niche metrics that we use to sort of quantify the, the variation that we see in trophic dynamics of the, of the over the years. So each dot represents a year for one of these functional groups is that we see in different parts of the estuary. So in the upper part of the estuary, the discharge of the river, for example, is very strong in driving the dynamics of the food webs in the upper part of the estuary. But down in the lower part of the estuary, it's actually how warm the temperature is during the driest parts of the year. And so you have these different things that sort of drive where the resources are coming from. And so we want to sort of understand you know, instead of being in these discrete boxes, we want to integrate all of this together into, into, the, um, into the landscape. And so what we come up with, and this is an approach for um, food webs, is that we use these uh, classified images, and then we uh, calculate, we use the organism, and we try to determine the home range or feeding range, which has its own issues, of the organism, and we put that across the map, and then we take our stable isotope information, we put that in a mixing model, and then we tie the, the, the results of that mixing model back to the habitats where those resources were produced, and then we integrate that across the landscape. And so what this looks like is we take this habitat classification map, and then we get what's called an energetic landscape. And so this energetic landscape in the red dots identifies areas that have higher, this is for mummy chogs, for example, areas that are in red or have higher energetic resources. And so what we hope to do is, is over time, we can look at how our habitats change make these maps of change, which are areas that have become good or bad, and then connect these to some of these larger known drivers of changes in productivity, changes in geomorphic structure as the marsh changes, and then responses to longer term drivers like sea level rise and temperature change in the water column. Thank you.